Um, and let me just say that uh, tonight uh, we will begin all of this with the 2013 winner of the Sir Robert Peel Medal for Distinguished Leadership in Evidence-Based Policing, Chief Constable Chris Sims of the West Midlands uh, Police, uh, who has um, uh, presided over a remarkable flowering of evidence-based policing in a very short period of time. By my calculation, more randomized experiments launched uh, under his watch there than any other police department uh, in the history of randomized experiments in policing. Uh, so that uh, this remarkable accomplishment does not pass without a systematic treatment. Uh, we gave him a medal last year, and we asked him to come back this year to tell us how he earned it. Uh, and so please join me in welcoming the Chief Constable of West Midlands Police, uh, Chris Sims. Hi, all. Well, nice to see you. Uh, very, very nice to be back. It doesn't seem a year ago that I was uh, standing here um, accepting great honour for, for Mary. Um, particularly pleased that uh, my man here uh, was, was the main presenter, as ever. Uh, I, I bow in your presence. Uh, it's a real, real honour to uh, receive uh, this as an award. Um, this is uh, actually the first time that I have uh, publicly spoken since uh, the loss of Bob Jones, my police and crime commissioner. So I would just please bear with me if you've travelled from afar and police and crime commissioners are something that you um, barely understand. But can I just say a couple of words about Bob? Because... Um, he certainly wouldn't want sort of mawkish uh, ceremony, that wasn't his style. Um, but I would like just to mark the contribution he made, not just to West Midlands Police, but across the whole realm of things, through the APA, through the College of Policing, uh, through way back through into uh, crime squads and, and beyond. And, and Dennis, I know you were um, a colleague of his on all sorts of bodies. And uh, Bob sadly died very suddenly a week ago today and uh, I know it would be very much missed by everyone in the West Midlands. So on with the show, on with today, and um, it is 12 months since I received the award. It was a, an odd experience at first. I obviously um, took some stick from colleagues in ACPO as um, suddenly being elevated as the token intellectual. Um, a little bit, little bit like um, the only boy wearing glasses in the playground on the first day at school. It was. Um, a chastening experience, but I've worked really hard over the last 12 months to re-establish my non-intellectual uh, capabilities and qualifications, and I think I arrived 12 months on pretty much on level footing. Now, I've been um, set uh, an essay question by Cambridge, as, as is their want, and there are all sorts of different themes that uh, I could have taken for, from this. And I suppose that the, particularly the people piece is, is one that, uh, if I had more time, I'd like to have spoken about, because um, Larry was generously talking about all the different pieces of experimentation that are going on in the West Midlands, and um, managing talented, eager, ambitious people um, can actually be quite an interesting experience. I wouldn't swap for anything, but it's, um, it still can be very interesting. But um, just for tonight, I want to focus really on just um, two questions that seem to me to be the most important issues of leadership around uh, that question. And, and they are that firstly, if we are not actually achieving real change on behalf of the public through this work, then there has to be a question as to why we're doing it in the first place. So my, my first duty, I think, as, as a police leader, is to make sure that the changes that are the subject of experimentation are actually coming through and being integrated into the way that policing develops in the future. If we forget that, then really you have to say it becomes a purely academic exercise, which of course has its validity, but doesn't really um, do what it needs to do on behalf of uh, people across the country. Second issue, um, again, very pertinent, I think, at the moment, is that we are faced with some real challenges about innovating at speed. 
And I don't think there's ever been a time through austerity, through um, the real changes in public expectation, that policing has had to change and improve and innovate. And it seems to me that um, we have a leadership duty to take the sources of that innovation from as wide a pool as possible, that we should leave metaphorically every stone unturned, or, or not leave every stone unturned, more to the point, um, in order to look at sources of innovation. And so what I want to do really is, is to, this evening just to sort of focus on those two issues. How do you actually make change happen and how do you create plurality in the sources of innovation? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk West Midlands, um, but I think when uh, joined in a second by colleagues, uh, I think they're gonna probably recognize many of the same challenges and be going through many of the same experiences. And I'm gonna start um, talking about our relationship with Cambridge. And Larry has um, pretty much stolen most of my territory here, but um, it is uh, very proud for me to note that a lot of the agenda over the next couple of days is made up by some of the major pieces of work that, that are going on in the West Midlands. So um, in no particular order, Turning Point, which Peter is uh, going to be talking about, and we are, having spoken to him on, on as I'm coming in, very close now to having some very important uh, findings from that work. Um, we have... Uh, Savvy that uh, was mentioned, which again has been a piece of work going for a couple of years and findings are now uh, available. And insight is probably the, the new kid on the block in terms of this conference um, is all about Schedule 7, which is one of our most sensitive pieces of terrorism legislation and has been led by a, a West Midlands officer who came to Cambridge as a student, picked it up as a project and has fundamentally changed some of our thinking across the country in the way those sensitive powers are used. And uh, I'm delighted to say that he is going to receive the recognition that he deserves uh, for that work later in the conference. Doubly pleased because um, he's also my staff officer and um, dedicates an awful lot of time doing that, uh, that work as well as uh, the work on, on research. So we have, a, I think, a really healthy, positive relationship with Cambridge. We've got a track record of exciting projects. We've got a flow of people who are coming back to us with enhanced skills as a result of the work that they've done. And I think, Larry, that we give a bit back because um, Alex Murray, one of our chief superintendents, plays a really critical part in terms of the research and student community across the country and indeed beyond. So very, very positive relationship with Cambridge University. But it would be wrong, I think, to simply focus on a single university even as grand as Cambridge. So we have a number of other important pieces of research that are working with other universities. Some of them happen because um, we approach the university. So, so the piece uh, with Warwick University is looking to validate some of our work on priority areas. Some of it happens because people approach us and I think find us um, a good force to work with, with good people who know their way around some, some of the sort of pitfalls of research. Uh, and probably the best example of that is the work uh, on serious and organised crime that is shaping up to be a very, very substantial piece of research uh, funded through the Police Foundation and uh, I think with some really exciting outcomes. So we've got the Cambridge relationship, we've got relationships with other key universities. <coughs> But we've also got a lot of other things as well. And this is, this is why I slightly feel like um, West Midlands is the target of the academic community, because um, we would appear to be doing business with 
many, many, many universities and, and institutions, from um, Oxford to Huddersfield, I think is a fair, a fair summary. Um, and again, some of these happen as a result of approaches where a university is perhaps working with a number of other forces. We, like other forces, run um, fairs, innovation fairs, where we offer ourselves up and academics offer up uh, their services. Um, some of them are directly in response to a problem that we face. Others are as a result of being approached. But we have uh, something like 90 pieces of work at different stages of development with, with different academic bodies uh, across the country. And I think the important piece is that if you went back a few years, there was um, an element of, of kind of randomness to those relationships. Um, we, I think, are getting better, probably still some work to do, at gatekeeping the way that the approaches are made, at being clear which pieces potentially add value to our change programme and to the work that we need to do, and on occasion saying no because we don't have the resources available to do justice to, to the piece of research. So um, a, a growing body, if you like, of, of contacts um, which will continue, I think, to yield some really positive results for, for our future and future of policing. Um, but I don't think um, the academic piece is by any means uh, the end of this. And I do think it's really important, and I know um, we have a, an audience um, which will quite properly have a very strong academic bias to it, to just think about the other sources of innovation that we draw upon. So we run our own force change programmes, we utilise very gifted people within the West Midlands, we draw upon good practice from other forces, um, from reports, from all sorts of other areas and, and research or non-research, and we help to sort of push forward and change the way West Midlands operates. Um, we increasingly work with other agencies and uh, I, I'm not here really talking so much about the collaboration word, I'm, I'm talking principally about how we co-deliver critical services with partners and probably the best examples at the moment, the most interesting examples sit within health, uh, sit around things like violent crime, around mental health, uh, around domestic abuse. Where, where we have some, some great relationships that are throwing up very different approaches to problems that we've faced for many, many years. We use consultancy. Um, now, I think, generally speaking, consultancy does not bring you innovation, but it brings you the ability sometimes to, to shape that innovation and make sure that it's working in the interests of the business. And over the past four or five years, we've used um, a big piece with PwC, a big piece with KPMG, and they have helped get, get our sort of austerity piece in line and allowed some of that innovation to sort of actually uh, get practical application. Um, and then we, we have uh, the, the more profound partnership with the private sector. Now this is, this is where I just have to declare um, that Bob's sudden death has, has done a little bit of damage to what I want to say next because the morning um, after he died, Bob was due to sign off um, an important piece of our contractual work with a, our preferred um, private sector partner. So we've got a whole host of legal issues that sit which um, I won't bore you with but uh, um, quite um, challenging and interesting. But I do just want to talk a little bit generally about what I think we can draw from those relationships with a private sector partner. And I think there's three, three things that we get. Firstly, I think we get access to learning from other sectors. And the sort of things that have been coming through from the bidding process are around um, logistics, around resilience, uh, around resource management, these are all kind of general capabilities that I think I would say that policing 
does less well than others in the commercial sector. And I would expect to draw from that and improve the way that we work. Um, we are going to get, whichever bidder eventually wins, we are going to get a host of ideas from different jurisdictions because these are both um, multinational organisations that are working across the world, um, doing some really, really interesting things, many of which are not yet operating in this country. And the sort of things I'm thinking of are principally around things like big data and analytics, um, around um, real-time working, which um, colleagues from, from the States will see in action and um, I guess see some of the benefits and maybe some of the, the costs. But these are, these are uh, capabilities that we think that we can import quickly that will help us. And last, but probably most importantly, the expertise that we get is the ability to actually implement this in an orderly fashion. Because again, one of the things I think policing is less good at doing is integrating all these fantastic ideas and turning them into a solid program that is capable of being delivered and supported. So, the attributes of the partnership that we seek very quickly are, firstly, that we want it to be a long-term relationship. So we're looking at a period of between five and eight years but we want maximum flexibility within it. So the way that it's structured is that um, after the first stage, which I'll describe in a minute, we only, in effect, trade with our partner if that partner is delivering areas of interest to us. The whole process begins by um, working rigorously through to develop a new operating model for policing in the West Midlands. And again, the, the ability, I think, to be able to do that systematically is something that has eluded wider policing and ought to be the benchmark against which all of this other work can be absorbed. And I think there is fantastic opportunity within that process of developing an operating model to draw in the sort of academic research that we're talking about over the next couple of days. Um, clearly, a lot of this is technology-based. And one of the, the big challenges um, in British policing for technology are the procurement rules that we have to combat. So the fact that both of these partners have a partner technologist working with them that will allow us to source some of that technology direct, I think is going to give us a, a massive advantage. We... Um, absolutely recognise that during the process of change you've got to carry on delivering normal business. So again, the ability of the partner to, to look at normal business and to be incentivised for us to carry on meeting our, our performance targets as well as delivering change is, is critical. They have to work within the financial envelope that we know uh, is coming, so, so they, in effect, take from us some of the responsibility of delivering the 25 million a year savings I have to make. And as I said at the s sort of at the start, they take responsibility for integrating the change into our new business model, which again is something that um, we have traditionally found difficult. So, to, to me, the um, business partnering piece in the jigsaw, if you look at from academic through partner work through business partnering, is absolutely critical to our future success. So let me, um, Larry, leave with two points. The two points that I started with, that um, all of this has to have purpose, that we have to continually refocus our efforts on real change that will give real improvements to the people that rely on policing. And that secondly, um, if we are serious about doing that, we need to be pluralist in the way that we approach innovation. So let's celebrate the contribution that Cambridge is making, but let's not just stop there, let's grab every other opportunity that we can find. Thank you very much.